Tenakoto and welcome to the Manawatu People's Radio and Manawatu Standard by Election Special Series with me, Fraser Gregg, and to my left, Jimmy Ellingham, the senior reporter from Manawatu Standard. In this series, we are interviewing the candidates in the Palmerston North City Council by election, the hopefuls vying for the seat left vacant by Tangi Utikeri in 2020 after his successful bid for the role of MP for Palmerston North. And in this episode, we have Nikita Skipper. Good morning to you. Kia ora <laughs> Um... Uh, for the purposes of, of a peek behind the curtain, you're the first woman that we've interviewed in this uh, series. I, I guess that's an interesting point to start with in terms of diversity. There are 11 candidates mm. and only three women. Yeah. Uh, are, you, are you wanting me to speak on it? Or? Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> is, is, is it the nature of the politics? Is it the nature of the institution? Oh, I love starting with a good feminist, <laughs> <laughs> feminist movement. No, for sure. I think... Um, in terms, again, I can only speak for myself. I'm, I'm very motivated to run for this because I know there's a lot of change that can happen. Um, but the woman that I have uh, spoken to, again, I reached out to all of the candidates. Vanessa is amazing. She's cool. She's cool. She's cool. Um, and we were kind of having a corridor based around our age group because we are similar age. So we're both 23. And we were just like, why Why aren't we seeing more women running, right? And it's because I, th- I think it is definitely an institutional problem. Again, um, I myself am Māori, but I'm also very, very white, you know, like like a, I was raised quite white. I only came into my kind of mouldiness, I suppose, when I was my first year of university when I was 18. So I've been raised very, very uh, privileged and very white throughout that time. So again, if it's if the system isn't welcoming in people, then you're not gonna you're not gonna see as the wider and I suppose proper term of diversity. Yeah. Um, this is your first time running for an elected position anywhere? Uh, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm a student politics girl. Um, yes, no, uh, so I kind of got to university with the dream of like, I'm going to, you know, it's going to be amazing and all this stuff. When I got to uni, I was like, oh, this isn't really what I thought it was going to be. Um, so I ran for student uh, president position there when I was 18. I was lucky enough to get that. I held that for two years, um, which was an amazing opportunity. And, and then I moved into uh, the National Student Union um, and I was the women's rights officer as well as the vice president there. Yeah. Cool. So you would cite then that you have some experience in that sort of governance bureaucratic yes. space. Yeah. I, again, again, a lot smaller then you know a <laughs> citywide but yeah working working with a demographic of people then yes yeah and, and what are you finding uh, most interesting about the campaigning Ooh, talking to people i love it <laughs> <laughs> i do i really i really am loving it uh i think i kind of came in with the idea that i had to kind of mold the way that i was running very very specifically to everything I've, I've ever seen and that's very like billboard you know door knocking on a saturday and like that's amazing and cool if you are doing that but i think um as i was talking a little bit earlier um it's it's cool to get creative with things and it's cool to have have my personality um, involved with a lot of what I am doing. Um, yeah. and, and so, what are you hearing on the on the, the campaign and the door knocking? Yeah. What what are the issues that you think voters are, are interested in? For sure, for sure, um, definitely housing. You know, I think it's a, it's a human rights issue that we're facing. Housing, for sure. Uh, engagement as well as, and and this is really interesting, this was raised around a lot of the older demographic that I've been uh, speaking to, and that's kindness in the city, and I thought that was really interesting in terms of an ideal. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, kindness is lacking in our city. Hmm. Uh, It says in uh, your candidate statement that you were one of the lucky few that actually managed to travel this year. Yeah, so... Uh, Oh, sorry. No, sorry. carry on, carry on. No, so, um, sorry, last year. Mm, yes. So, yes, yeah. 2020. Um, so, I was lucky enough to head over to uh, Asia uh, the 28th, so like, what is that, a day or two ago on the 28th of January, and uh, I was working... Um, with the UN at that point. So we were just doing a tour. Basically, they just took over heaps of Kiwi kids and we were learning about globalisation um, and then looking to bring that back into New Zealand. But yeah, so um, we went throughout Southeast Asia and we also uh, touched on Japan. We were going to go to China, but of course, reasons <laughs> reasons um, that don't need explaining, we uh, yeah, kind of detoured, came back quite early. But Overall, like uh, that was the first proper time that I'd ever travelled, and it was amazing. Uh, I fell in love with Cambodia. I think that's we've got a lot to learn from there. Um, and so, what about that experience, and yeah. particularly the impact of COVID on you know? 
cutting your journey short, short mm. and bringing it back and seeing the, the COVID response mm. in New Zealand. Uh, is that informing any of your platforms uh, as you run for council? Is there any anything there? Great question. Uh, definitely. And I think this ties into the the point I made earlier around kindness in the city. When I was over in Southeast Asia, everyone was was very uh, aware that this was something that, we couldn't be selfish about this, we had to think about everyone. And again, it was that wearing a mask, it was hand sanitising, it was washing our hands, it was being very, very aware of our actions. Not saying that Palmerston North didn't do it, but I think that in terms of the wave of COVID, yeah, we can do a lot better as a society and maybe we can look at more kinder things, at kinder uh, ways of working together. Uh, in the candidate statements, a lot of people have chosen to highlight key areas that they want to advocate for mm -hmm. so that people understand their values and their positions. Mm -hmm. uh, you've taken a, a, a different approach in just mm -hmm. saying who you are mm -hmm. uh, as a person. Uh, you've said you believe in change and that starts socially. What are some of the, the key things that maybe tie into that so that people can understand what you may advocate for or oppose when you're in council? Definitely. I'm a big, big uh, believer that... Uh, equity is the way to go. So um, looking at race, class and gender in terms of what is uh, halting our city. Um, yeah, I totally agree because once I read everyone else's, I was like, oh, I did it wrong. But then actually, you know, there is no wrong way. Um, I definitely believe in creating an environment in Palmerston North where we are thinking about one another constantly. And I'm not saying that we need to be um, you know, <laughs> we need to be like, oh, I shouldn't stand there. Someone else might stand there. But I mean, in terms of looking at what is wrong around Palmy, in terms of housing, in terms of uh, our environment, you know, this is these are connected. This is, if we look after our people holistically, everything else will flow on from that. And it's looking at... Uh, I suppose the issues through through a te ao Māori lens as well. Yeah, thank you. The, those are, are great from sort of ideological or, mm -hmm. or ethical standpoints, but you always will, round the council table, have to sort of compromise mm -hmm. those facts with what's it going to cost. Mm -hmm. So how, how are, are you prepared to do that? Are you prepared to stand up in front of people and justify a decision that may go against your sort of ideological standpoint on the basis that it just costs too much? Oh, that's a really great question. Um, again, when I when I was in student politics, uh, there was a lot of negotiations that had to be done. Again, a smaller scale, but in terms of you know yearly, we would go in and bet uh, for students with with the university and saying, hey, look, we need this much money to function in order to do these things that are going to make life easier for students. And in turn, the university would be like, Bleh! that's not in budget. And so it was it was very much a back and forth. Um, again, I'm, I'm not downright going to say, heck no, but if it doesn't align with my values, then I will be very strict on that. Um, you, you, you mentioned engagement before, and, and this is an issue that's as old as city councils, pretty much, uh, trying to get uh, the community engaged, mm -hmm. trying to build the turnout for elections. This by-election is predicted to have a really low yep. turnout. We've for just sure. had a general election. Yep. There's 11 candidates. It, 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 it's not very appetising to people. Um, I remember when Abby Symes ran mm -hmm. for mayor and council, she put so much effort into trying to engage mm. youth and they just didn't show up. Mm. Uh, do you have any other bright ideas to try and get the youth vote and, and youth as a whole involved in politics? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I've, I've heard this really interesting term kind of used throughout um, that this is like a young person's election. The thing is, young people, you know, majority, we have four uh, tertiary institutions here and those majority are the people who are going to be voting unless you're 18 in high school. You're not here. You're working back in your hometown. You're working back in your home city at this point. You're not going to be engaged when you come into the city because you're not welcomed. A lot of the big point of it as well, in order to vote in the city, you have to. this has to be your, I always struggle to say this word, electorate. Mm -hmm. So young people are coming into the city. We're not changing our electorates. We're staying at home because we don't see ourselves in the city. And again, we might see ourselves here for a short amount of time in terms of three, five, seven years, however long it might be or how long you might be in the city, but there's nothing keeping us here. So I think there needs to be a big drive in terms of uh, talking to our young people as well and saying, well, what is going to keep you in the city or what is going to keep you engaged in the city and what is it going to take to make you change your postcode so this is and feels like your home? 
That's, uh, d to be honest, that's one of the first times I've heard someone actually suggest a, 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 a meaningful way to tackle engagement. So you're suggesting people that don't recognise Palmerston mm. North as their home, making them rethink that. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Um, what other sort of principles are, are you standing on? Again, not that you did your candidate statement wrong, but mm. just that trying to find out more about you. What are some of the, the principles that you hold that would translate into things that voters want to see rates spent on, like mm -hmm. infrastructure, uh, mm -hmm. the the nature calls consultation and the wastewater? What are some, some of the standpoints you have on those? Yeah, definitely. Um, for sure, housing. Housing is my one and in, in foremost. Again, I'm a child of, um, I'm a child of social housing and I know what it feels like to have housing insecure. And I had that very, very young in life. Um, raised by a sole mother. So again, yeah, social housing was something. And I and I knew kind of yearly that we were going to move somewhere else. So I've been to a total of like eight primary schools and two high schools throughout that time. So uh, housing, uh, I, I want housing for people to feel like a home. Again, I think we need to think about the houses that will and should be built in Palmerston North. I think we should be looking at other ways in terms of just not the basic four bedroom, couple of bathrooms. You know, we need to be thinking about diverse families. We need to be thinking about wheelchair accessibility and what that means for a community. We need to be thinking about um, the how many bedrooms we need to be filling in. We need to be thinking about, is it gonna be upstairs, downstairs? People are gonna be living with grandparents. You know, every housing situation is very, very different. And we also need to be thinking about the rent as well. This is a very, very hard time and a lot of people are, are working so, so hard to put food on the table. Again, myself, I'm, I'm working full time. My mum lost her job through COVID, so I'm helping to support her. So, you know, if, if my rent were to increase, I might have to think about leaving Palmerston North and moving back home. Mm. Um, yeah, so housing is, is my uh, biggest <laughs> one um, in terms of envir environment, for sure. Again, everything is connected. It is connected to the way we are treating our people. If we aren't uh, looking after uh, our environments, then we're not looking after our people. And if we're not looking after our people, people aren't going to care about the environment. At the end of the day, we need a city that is, is people first. And I think you can't be that without actively looking after your people. And do you think the council is not achieving that at all? Or do you think it is a case of if you are elected, your voice in amongst those 16 will be enough to make that focus change on people and, and that holistic approach? Hmm. Again, I think of politics. I'm, I'm not in it for the, for the crazy rat race that it can be. I'm here to create real change. And if, if I'm not elected, I will still absolutely drive that the, city, that the city is putting people first. And it might not be my voice in there, but if it is, it'd be cool. <laughs> but if it's not, then there are different ways of, of helping to motivate our council. Again, the council are elected by us. We should be there uh, to hold them accountable again. Yeah. Marvellous. Let's turn to Jimmy Ellingham from the Manawatu 2 Standard. He has some questions from readers and NPR listeners. Cool. Yes, thank you, Fraser, and thanks uh, for coming in this morning. <laughs> um, just before I get to questions from readers and listeners, we were talking housing, and you talk about how they needs to, we need to think about the types of housing built in the city. Mm. Are, you, are you talking both public and social housing here, as well as you know, private housing? And if so, how, how can that be done to affect what private developers are building? I think I'm more so going on social housing level. Um, again, that's where the most need is at the moment. Private housing, um, in terms of, no, I'll st sorry, I'll stick to my first first topic first. So social housing, it's a matter of speaking and, and uh coordinating the way we are talking to people, right? If this housing is for you, this isn't a matter of you moving into it and, you know, that's just it. This is a matter of, okay, well, what are your, what are your needs? What is your needs as, uh, what are your needs as a uh, family? What are your needs um, in terms of what's going to make you feel most comfortable in your home? Um, yeah, like what is going to make this feel like a home, not something that you're going to be shoved out of in like a month, three months or a year's time. Um, in terms of, I suppose, development in the city, coming, speaking broader, sorry, in terms of uh, the houses that are being built in terms of private, I think that there needs to be almost a life, plan for for housing in terms of what's going to happen to it the day it's developed to the day that it crumbles down what's going to happen in terms of the environmental needs that are that are also coming out of it um, 
it busts down in 10 years time, we have to rip it down. What's going to happen to those materials and what is that going to look like in terms of uh, our city kind of re reduce reusing or, or whatever from there? Sorry, I don't know if that made sense. So many things going on in my head. <laughs> <laughs> if I can return you, if I can, just for social housing, the city yep. council obviously owns uh, flats mm -hmm. around town, council flats as people call them. Would you be advocating for more of these? Yep, absolutely. I think if there's a housing need, more houses need to be built. That's just it. And, and what can be done from a council perspective? If, if you talk about housing, obviously a lot of the housing is not council mm -hmm. housing, it's mm -hmm. state housing, for lack of a better, better word. What can the council do there, given that we have a growing state house, public house waiting list, and we're, not, we're getting an increase in numbers, but it's not, uh, it's not a big increase, if an increase at all, as far as public housing is concerned, whereas that waiting list keeps growing? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Like, if... <laughs> I remember when I was younger and we were moving between houses and me and my mum ended up spending a night in our car because we didn't have access to, to anywhere to stay and we didn't have family or friends around us again due to moving around um, so much. We'd skip towns, you know, all that kind of stuff. So in terms of uh, creating more houses and flats or whatever, we need to also, we also need to be thinking in terms of those who are being homed and those who are being housed because I do know that there are stories where people are having to go all the way to Whanganui in order to have a night, uh, you know, a safe night's sleep and then coming back to Palmerston North to, to work. Um, sorry, do you mind repeating the question? I think I've just gone a bit I was just wondering what the there. council can do. How, how can the council work, if you oh. like, with Kainga Ola and that sort of, and mm -hmm. perhaps uh, social housing providers to ensure that the needs of people in the city are mm. being met what, and what would you do as a councillor to encourage this? Yeah, sorry, sorry for getting you to repeat that. Um, no, for sure. Again, I think that comes down to that question of engagement. It's talking with with our communities, it's saying, okay, well, we're not necessarily just talking to uh, those who are voting in this election, we're talking to those who aren't engaged and I think that's a lot of the time the, the demographic that the council is missing out on. Again, uh, I've heard many, many stories of people saying, yeah, well, we, we, we've, we've had this conversation, haven't we? Did we? Because I wasn't there for that. And I'm pretty sure that uh, my demographic of people are never there for that conversation. Um, in terms of, uh, yeah. Can, can I interrupt you there? Yeah. Sorry, I mean, how, how will you reach those people? Because the council perhaps will say it tries, it has social <laughs> media posts, it sends out letters for, for some things, yeah. and people... It, might say choose not to mm. be part of it how, how can we change that so these people aren't choosing to be part of it or, or do they not know you think oh that's a big question no it's, it's really not actually um in terms <laughs> in terms of engaging it's a matter of getting up going out again I can I can say that oh yeah yeah I shared a post on Instagram and I, I got 14 likes you know that's great engagement but I'm engaging with the same people every time what I need to do from there is talk to their communities and talk to communities that I wouldn't usually feel comfortable in and it's a matter of getting uncomfortable in order to create change. You were elected as a leader of the city so what are you going to do to get amongst it? And I know when I was um, student president uh, every week I would go and talk to a new club or I would go and talk to uh, a new a community of people that I'd, I'd never interacted with or, or again hadn't been on my radar um, and it's just keeping that engagement very alive but also I think if you're a councillor you should be the face of the city right like you should be out and about and I'm, I'm not here to slam councillors but there's only one councillor that kind of votes uh, sorry floats in, in my circles and that's Brent I've not ever seen any other any other councillor out and about yeah Thanks to Kate. I think we've got time for just one more question by the looks of it. And this is one we're uh, asking all the candidates. Yep. Uh, someone, uh, a reader, just asked us Ooh. to ask all you um, who you were nominated by and who seconded you. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> cool bananas. Um, I was nominated by, uh, oh, do I have to say the name? Can I just say my flatmate? So, I think they want to know names. Okay, yeah, but, cool. Uh, but it's up to you what you uh, yeah. <laughs> provide us with. <laughs> Shout out, um, Georgia Donaldson, who uh, was an ex-flatmate of mine, and then my other flatmate, um, Caitlin Day. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, well, thank you very much for that. Sweet as. Yeah, uh, thank you, Nikita. Uh, that's all we have time for, but thank cool. you for joining us uh, this morning. Uh, yep, that's all we've got time for in this episode of the NPR and Manawatu 2 Standard By-Election Special. Other episodes are available at npr.nz forward slash show forward slash by-election 21. Uh, the series is also running in the first week of February, Monday to Friday at 9 a.m. on NPR. That's 999 a.m. across Manawatu or via the live stream at npr.nz. Of course, keep an eye on the Manawatu Standard for further coverage, including the results on the 22nd of February. And remember, you must have your vote posted in a DX mailbox or directly to the City Council by 12 p.m. on Wednesday, the 17th of February, for your vote to be counted in this election. Thank you for joining us, Tenakoto. Thank you.